So then the, uh, are you saying that... Um, uh, oh, by the way, commissioners, you know, the, 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 the conditions for this specific plan, project permit compliance, is two beach impact, oh, no, no. two beach impact zones are required for a change of use that results in an intensification of use or increased vehicle trips. Pursuant to LAMC 1223B, non-conforming parking, the project maintains a seven parking space credit. The project shall provide 14 additional parking spaces instead of the, uh, based upon the approved service floor area and the required in beach impact zone either on or off site as provided in section 1226E5 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code. Alternatively, the applicant can use any of the following uh, um, options to provide for any deficiency. They can pay the in lieu fee, they can reduce the service floor area to match, or they can start supplying upwards of uh, bicycle parking spaces but did, for those. Excuse me, didn't you just indicate that in lieu fees would not be allowed? But when this no, 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 I said that they are allowed. They are allowed. So, well, I was wondering, I thought you were saying the, um, the uh, seven space parking credit. I, I, well, that's part of the calculation as well. And they get that credit and you subtract that from the total amount that would have been needed for the service floor area. So when they change the use, they still get the credit for the seven spaces? Okay. Then that, that's, that, that's not the same as the grandfathered spaces? That's my understanding from the calculations that were provided in the project permit compliance. So I guess I am, I'm a little confused. If they change the use, I thought they were not allowed to use grandfathered spaces. And, I have, and when it says a seven space parking credit, isn't that as a resulting from the grandfathered spaces? Yes. See, that's part of it. It says F, as if it's a new parking uh, project. But remember, even if it's a new parking, you still have to give them the credit because the specific plan never spoke to that. No. So the El Los Angeles Municipal Code credit still continues forward. Even, even in it with a change of use? Correct. No. That, that, that's where I'm a little confused. Uh, if, if there's a change in use and you're not allowed to use grandfather spaces, how do they maintain a seven space credit after a change of use? In other words, instead of having to provide 14 additional parking spaces with a change of use, should they be required to provide 21 uh, additional parking spaces? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. And then we'll move on with our hearing. Um, it's time to hear from the uh, applicant. Um, we've got two uh, names uh, put up here, uh, Stephen Vitalich and Sam uh, Marshall. And uh, um, normally I will just give you five minutes, but I'll be generous if you can try to be concise and brief. Thank you, Commissioner Donovan. Uh, I'm Stephen Vitalich, um, representative for the applicant. My colleague Sam Marshall is showing some visuals here that uh, illustrate the context of the project. Um, <clears throat> first, of, um, just, I'm just, a quick point, uh, just a quick point of order. Um, before the hearing, uh, Sam Marshall, um, uh, the uh, uh, planning department, doing uh, department, and uh, council's office took us outside, uh, told us that uh, this would be continued. As a result, the applicant has left, along with uh, a lot of people that were going to be here. So we just want that on the record that uh, we were told this was not going to be happening this evening. Thank you. Yeah. No, 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 no uh, excuse me. this is Theodore Irving. Uh, he's just making a comment for the record. You already started this process. You're more than welcome to continue it. So okay. that's just. All right. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is I'd like to address the uh, points that were brought up by the appellant. And uh, I'd also like to address some of the concerns that were brought up by the commissioners. Um, but I, and I'd also like to clear up some confusion about what the planning department is trying to describe as, as far as the non-conforming parking credits and how they apply towards the change of use. <clears throat> the way that I understand the specific plan is that 
when you have a property that was not required to have parking because it was constructed before the parking requirements were even imposed, you have non-conforming parking credits. The existing use of the building is retail. There's 1,042 square feet of retail, and there's 616 square feet of takeout restaurant. That in total has, in actuality, the takeout restaurant should be entitled to 10 credit parking spaces, 10 parking space credit, and the retail is one space for 225 square feet. What we did was we only took a seven parking space credit for the existing uses and applied them against the required parking for the new proposed use, change of use. So the change of use, which would require 21 parking spaces, has been reduced by seven, which result, resulted into 14 parking spaces that were required to support our project. So that's, that's I think, helps kind of clarify what Kevin was trying to explain with regards to the non-conforming parking credits, which are applied against the required parking and get you a net parking result of what we are trying to satisfy, what we did satisfy through in the parking. So um, as the project was described, it's, it's, an existing, it's an existing building that has 1,042 square feet of retail and 616 square feet of, of existing takeout restaurant. Um, the appellant did bring up the point that the project, the property has been operating out of compliance as an existing restaurant. There's never been any alcohol sales on the property. The property has never had any alcohol sales. It's only been operating as a food service establishment. That's it. It has not had any violations that were imposed by anybody, except for code enforcement coming in and saying that they needed to upgrade a hood or some finish in the kitchen that wasn't compliant. Um, the issue about the CEQA issue that was brought up, um, when this project was filed, it was filed, the bifurcation issue, the project was originally filed as a DIR in 2010. In 2010, the DIR was filed, the project exhibits that were attached to the report that Kevin Jones prepared um, for, this, for this hearing um, were the original plans that were filed. The project then changed, and it changed as a result of a number of issues. The, the project changed because the owner decided to change the project. So in 2012, we went back and we filed a ZA case. The case that was being determined by the, the planning department and the, under the SPP was put on hold. The planner at the time who was handling that for the planning department put that case on hold in light of the fact that we were submitting a new ZA case. The ZA case was filed in 2012. That ZA case was then put on hold as well because of the whole MAO issue that um, Shana, was, Shana Boston was describing that took place. So the bifurcation issue was not intentional. We did not intentionally do it that way. It was a way that this, the city had set up the process to be able to file the case. We filed it as two separate actions. Now the city has adopted a new policy where the, the, when you file a ZA case, you file everything at the same time, and the SPP is included in that. This was not intentional. It was not an intention by any stretch of the imagination. We didn't do this intentionally. And subsequently, we were required to file an EAF because they also, the MAO requires to file the EAF. When we originally filed the ZA case in 2012, we were given a categorical exemption for, that's at the planning counter by the, zoning, by the, by the planner. He didn't require us to file the EAF. Then we were waiting a year, and the case was scheduled for hearing, and then the hearing was delayed because we had to file an EAF. So we filed the EAF. So we've done everything that we have been required to do to bring this plan and the case file into compliance with required to the city requirements and the planning requirements and CEQA and so forth and so on. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the appellant brings up the issue that, uh, that the community has never had an opportunity to chime in on this project. That's not true. We had a community outreach meeting on December 15th of 2012. It was, it was a representative from the Land Use and Planning Committee of the Neighborhood Council that was at that meeting. Then subsequently we had two meetings with the Neighborhood Council Land Use and Planning Committee. The Land Use, Land Use and Planning Committee, when we presented this project, they basically told us that we were crazy. Number one, the larger issue here with respect to the Neighborhood Council and the Land Use and Planning Committee is, is that they don't really like to support any projects that are being done in Venice with the in lieu fee provision. The in lieu fee parking provision is part of the code. It's the municipal code, it's, it's part of the Venice Pacific plan. It's the law, for, for, that's a simple fact. And so we asked for this project to be considered under those provisions. The Venice Neighborhood Council doesn't like that. They don't like that, that, that condition. They don't believe that the in fee parking amount of $18,000 per parking space is adequate, but that's the law, that's what it says. And until, as Kevin Jones mentioned earlier, until the city council takes it on themselves to adopt and change and amend the specific plan, that's pretty much what we have to deal with. 
So we're, we're, we believe that we've done everything inconsistent with the law and the code, and going forward, we believe that the project should be supported by this commission and the appeal should be denied as, as the planning department has recommended. Um, that's, that's kind of our position on the, on the, on the project, so. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Looks like we don't have any right now. Oh, wait, wait, maybe. Do we? Sure. Could Question. you talk about the noise attenuation and mitigation? Absolutely. Um, so the 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 issue of noise is not something that we're completely oblivious to. The idea that that um, that we're just building a, a dining terrace that's just going to spew noise out into the community is not true. We have enlisted the services of a very highly respected acoustical engineer. There's a 12-page report that was prepared and presented to the DA's office, which their determination was based on and included in the determination. Um, I can provide that again, that report. It, and it stipulates in that report, as, as um, someone mentioned earlier, I think, um, it was the representative from the DA's office mentioned that the LA Municipal Code, Chapter 11, has noise regulation standards in it, and it requires that a test be done to, re to anal analyze the ambient noise of the area. And then you look at what the proposed improvement is and what the impact on that is. And there's an acceptable sort of baseline level that you have to meet. And if, the, if your imposed change or the change that you're imposing on that area exceeds the decibel level by more than 5 dB, then you have to mitigate. And you have to mitigate to an acceptable level that's in the code. Not to nothing, but to an acceptable level. And what that acceptable level is, 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 is determined by building and safety and their experts to make sure that you've mitigated to an acceptable level within the code requirements and the, and the municipal code standard. So, what so does your study, what does it forecast? It gave us, a, it gave us the design parameters and it, it stipulated that we needed to maintain an eight foot high wall that was opaque and not operable and had no windows opening facing north, which is the alley that's adjacent to the residential use right across the alley. Is that on the roof? Uh, yes. Okay. So, yeah, you can't, you have to. Okay. So, it's hard to talk when I'm doing this. So, if you look at this photo, this is the proposed building right here. The, the issue, the, the building that that the appellant was concerned about, which is residential use, is right here. This is an alley that runs east and west. This is Hampton Drive that runs north and south, if you will. And this is Rose Avenue. So they're making, they're making the argument that this is in, directly in a residential neighborhood. For the most part, everything around this area is all zoned M1 or C2. The only properties that are zoned in the R zone are across the street, and they're here and going north towards Santa Monica. So what is the mitigation so, for that property on the southeast corner? I'm sorry, over here? No, on the east side, right there. Right. Yep. Here? No? South? To your south right. is this one? All right, north and north, sorry. Yes? Yeah, down. Okay, now east. There you go, right there. This here? That one. This is, this is a four-unit residential home, right. and it's across the street. Right. So the issue is, is that anything that is generated from this rooftop dining terrace, we have to mitigate sound that might transmit this way. And we have to mitigate it to an acceptable level within the code. And so we've been given design parameters within that report that require us to comply with it. Right, and so, you, so you talked about the, the one due north. I'm sorry? You talked about the this one here. For, for that residential Yeah, this, the, wall right. that's on, the wall that's on the north side can have no openings in it. Right, and what about on the other side of Hampton? So how do you how do you mitigate noise traveling across Hampton? Yeah, we are actually proposing that the majority of it, the, the design that you have in front of you right now shows pretty much an open dining terrace. We've had number a number of meetings with the owner of this property. We've had a number of opportunities to, to look at and see what the conditions that are being imposed on the project by the ZA and and the DIR. And we realize that there's not we have to create a certain amount of closure here in order to be able to mitigate the sound. So that's what's going to end up happening. As if, if we get the entitlements for this project to move forward, building and safety is going to be required to, to re enforce those conditions of approval. This commission also has the ability to be able to impose conditions and modify the ZA determination. And you can, you can further impose conditions on the project that will mitigate the sound issue. We're not going to be able to eliminate sound. It's impossible to do. But we can mitigate it to within acceptable levels so that the code allows us to do. 
The other thing that I wanted to mention too that's really important is, is the, the appellant was bringing up the issue of the FAR issue. The FAR issue doesn't apply in this case. If you read the specific plan, the FAR restriction of 0.5 to 1 is relative to a commercially zoned property. This is an M1 zone property. If you read the specific plan, M1 zone properties, that doesn't apply. What, what is the roof material? I mean, it's, some of the drawings, is it a tree? And yeah, there's, there was a reason, yeah, the original it's idea was to try to get some sort of organic sort of rooftop dining terrace garden, if you will. That's, that's going to change probably. There may be a tree here, but for the most part, there'll be some sort of roof structure that will be able to help mitigate the sound and be able to attenuate sound. Commissioner Guyton, will there be, uh, on the rooftop, will it just be tables? There won't, there won't be a bar up there? There's no bar on the property at all. There's a counter that was on, on the plans that you have, there's an area that's on the ground floor that's, that's a, sort of, it looks like it could be a bar, but there's not gonna be a bar. It's, it's the, the intention of this is of being a restaurant. Because of the full line alcohol, there's always the implication that people think it's a bar. It's not a bar. When it says bar on the plant, I have to tell you that implies. Yeah, I, I, I understand that that's. <laughs> and when there's stools in the rendering, I mean, there's a lot of clues here. <laughs> but it's not a bar. Commissioner sure Waltz Morago, um, uh, there is no bathroom up top. It's just the bathrooms are downstairs. Downstairs, but there's an elevator that goes up and down. And that's the cent central thing is the elevator. Yes, the core. Yes. And lighting wise, I mean, if the if the roof is going to be open for a tree to go through it so it's well not that's covered i mean that's a that was a, a you know yeah. an artist rendering and but uh your your thoughts about how it's going to be lit are you going to have heaters you know those 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 heaters that go up in the sky you know what i'm talking about i mean well there would if there would if there were heaters there would be heaters that would direct the heat onto the seating area and they wouldn't be the heat would not be spilling out into the adjacent areas okay. and they wouldn't be creating a glow or some sort of a light effect that would affect neighboring properties okay. those would all have to be you know handled in an appropriate manner so it wouldn't have an adverse effect on the neighboring properties okay uh, commissioner donovan i'm wondering about the hours 7 a.m on sunday morning yeah it's it's breakfast i mean the, the current operation of the restaurant which operates as a restaurant called sauce um, it's a breakfast, lunch, and dinner place, and it's a little neighborhood place. And the, this is going to this the, the proposed the proposed redesign of this property is is nothing like that. But 7 a.m. to be able to do a breakfast operation in that neighborhood, it's if if you know the area at all, I, I think if you've driven around the property at all, you see that it's it's only probably 150 feet from the Rose Cafe. The Rose Cafe currently really doesn't even do evening seating. They don't do any eating business at all. They're a breakfast and lunch operation, afternoon operation. And that and that restaurant now has been granted full line alcohol and it's gonna be changing as well. So right around the corner there's the firehouse and they have full line alcohol as well. So would you be comfortable with a condition prohibiting any kind of I can't hear you. Yeah please I have to ask you to be quiet. Uh, would you be comfortable with any kind of a condition that would preclude any kind of bar in, in the premises? Yeah, I think that the, the, if, if, if we had a sit-down counter area that it wasn't a bar, absolutely. I mean, there's, the, the intention, for the, the owner has no intention of this becoming a bar. I mean, the, the reality is it's not going to be a place where people just go and have a cocktail. I, 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 I understand, but if you heard the last thing, I, I, yeah, bar, I understand. Yeah. You know, now we're if, thinking, well, if, we better put it in if the commission, If the commission wanted to impose that kind of a condition, that there were no bar, the, I think the the applicant would be perfectly okay with that. He's not intending on doing. He, he wants to have a sit down quality restaurant. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention, just one thing about the parking, and, and that we, we are not able to provide. We would love to be able to provide the parking on site. We would love to be able to provide parking. I mean, our neighborhood. I live in the neighborhood. I've been a resident of the neighborhood for more than 25 years. The reality is, we're a parking starved community. It's a big issue in Venice. It's an infrastructure problem. We need to do something about it. The city needs to do something about it. I think that that putting the onus on a private individual or a business owner to try to man, try to meet the requirements and satisfy the needs of the of this big inf larger issue is really quite cumbersome and unfortunate. But the owner is willing to enter into an agreement and actually have a condition that we would be agreeable to doing a valet system, and we could park and take advantage of the beach parking available at the end of Rose Avenue, which is roughly a half a mile away. Excuse me, I don't believe you legally can do that. Excuse me? I don't believe you can legally use uh, the beach park. You can enter into an agreement with the city parking, and we, we've, we've, we've I, already approached. I don't believe, 
Coastal Commission would approve the use of beach parking or we're not we're not you, excuse me Commissioner Halper it, it's not it's not a measure we we are trying to satisfy our required parking through in lieu fee provisions bicycle parking ordinance and the non-conforming parking credits what we're saying is is that we're sensitive to the parking issue and we're sensitive to the issue of parking and that that there's an impact and if we can help mitigate that to some extent, we're willing to have the property condition to provide valet parking, and we can accommodate the valet. We can figure out a way to house those vehicles somewhere in the process of supporting the restaurant. Appreciate that, but I think you, by stating the fact that you could use the beach parking for that purpose, would not fly. But okay. Okay. Thank you. Any further I, questions? I have one one more yeah, question. Go ahead which is, can you explain the first floor enclosure? Again, the, the drawings we have don't seem to be... Yeah, the drawings that you have don't really indicate an enclosure at the first right. floor. The, these are a more, this, these are an iteration, more recent iteration, that we're addressing some of the concerns about noise and, and noise migration and filtration. And so there's actually a glass enclosure that would be on the ground floor that would enclose that area. So from adjacent to the public way, it would be protected. Is there a is it is there a roof to it or is it open to the No, there's the 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 floor of the second level canopies over that area. Sorry. So there's there's a kind of acoustical break between the top of the facade and the floor of the second level. No, there wouldn't be. Can you show me on the drawing where the enclosure is between the facade and the bottom of the floor of the second level? Well, with, yeah. So what you're seeing is, is it, you're seeing this fenestration system continue across here, and then you're seeing a break between here Correct. and here. But what this would end up to be, there would end up to be the existing roof structure that we have to maintain to retain our parking credits would be incorporated into this element here. So there would actually be a roofed area over this here. Okay. So this would be this would be a concrete column that penetrated that structure, and then this would be floating on top of that. You asked for some clarification about the parking oh, yes, and sir. the retention of non-conforming rights. This is not a complete demo. We only need to, con to retain a portion of the walls to retain those non-conforming rights. The plans in both indicate that they will be retaining the adequate amount of walls to retain those non-conforming rights. So therefore, they are allowed to claim that seven, that seven space credit that you were alluding to in addition to the other provisions. So yes, it's confusing. But when you look at the fact that the Venice specific plan is silent on certain provisions, the Los Angeles Municipal Code 1223B8 contains provisions on how to uh, determine the amounts of parking credits on uh, for change of use or any other alterations. So to answer your question and to answer the public, while I understand that their their claim was that they lost on non-conforming rights, my statements about remembering what constitutes a wall, how much you have to retain, then you are able to retain your non-conforming rights. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go to the public uh, comment against the appeal. We've got a stack here. So we'll do it just like the last time. I'll say three names. Each one of you will have two minutes. And um, feel free to say, I agree with the last person said, and, and that you still have two minutes, but we'll give you the time you need. Okay, these are not, again, in any particular order. That's just how they were handed to me. If I have you wrong, and this is not the right case you want to talk on, just let me know. First three names are James McCullough, Maripaz Marumba, and uh, Gabrielle. I'm challenged on this one. Um, yes, that sounds good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. President, Theodore, before you continue with the public hearing portion, the comment was made by an earlier uh, speaker that we had a conversation outside and that um, we gave an indication that we will uh, not be holding the hearing. Uh, and I just want to clarify that. Sure. Uh, so we had to have a conversation and there was some consideration because of some things, some technical things. Uh, but we made clear that we had no authority to say 
that we want to continue. It's not, it's your hearing, it's a, and so we don't have any authority to say that. So I just want to clarify that. It was part of the discussion, but again, staff here has no authority to say we want to continue. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, please uh, step forward, state your name and address, you have two minutes. Hello, my name is James McCullough, and I'm a Venice resident. Um, firstly, just so that we clear up the uh, acoustic uh, and uh, sound issues, um, I'm a professional sound engineer for 20 years. I've worked with people like Katy Perry, Journey, In Excess, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that you understand the difference of 5 dB, because there's a, um, a variance of 5 dB that uh, is allowed um, above the average uh, sound pressure level. Uh, 5 dB. 3 dB is a double in uh, power. 6 dB is uh, uh, a double in um, amplitude. And uh, 10 dB uh, is a perceived double in volume to the human ear. So that means, at best, it's 50% increase of what we perceive. So I hope that clears up, you know, what uh, uh, the sound uh, uh, issues are. It means that as a resident, you're going to have a 50% increase in the ambient noise that you hear from your next door neighbor or the restaurant over there. Um, the second thing I wanted, wanted to mention was that uh, I find it really hard to grasp the concept of the good neighbor and conditions that could be imposed uh, or might not be imposed when it's pretty clear that the restaurant has been operating illegally for four years as a restaurant and what use of conditions going to provide when they have absolutely no regard for the law as it is um, by just operating as a restaurant and uh, I think that, that that's a big issue for us as residents and neighbors because it doesn't really give any substance to the law. Uh, if they were really good neighbors, they would have respected the fact that they need the correct permits and uh, gone ahead and waited before they carried on as a restaurant. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mira Cosmo Marambo. I'm actually a resident of 235 Main Street, Venice, number 291. I am on the board, member board of our HOA association at the Venice Renaissance, which occupies 235, 245, and 255 Main Street. Um, we are quite concerned about the nuisances that this would have on our community, so I appreciate Commissioner Margulies looking out for our community and the residents, and so I'm just for support. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Get your name and address, you have two minutes. Gabriel Ruspini, 980 Elkland Place, number three, Venice. Uh, for purposes of identification, I'm a member of the Venice Neighborhood Council Land Use and Planning Committee, but I speak to you now solely as an individual. This project and the forms it, in which it has been presented in the project permit compliance and the coastal development permit and additional <laughs> use permit cases are flawed to such a significant amount to warrant the approval of this appeal. Firstly, a, a one-story scheme was submitted for project permit compliance and approved. Subsequently, an alternate scheme was generated, submitted for coastal development permit and CUV and approved. It should be noted that this second scheme, which includes a cantilevered outdoor second floor terrace, has not been reviewed per the permit project permit compliance process and should at a minimum be sent back to obtain that. The project intended to be built should be the one that is deemed compliant, not a previous iteration. Secondly, plans submitted for CDP CUV depict the previously mentioned second floor terrace projecting beyond the front property line, encroaching into the right of way at Hampton. The project as currently proposed imposes on public land which is grounds for its rejection simply on that point alone. It's difficult to believe how a private project encroaching on the public right of way um, uh, complies with the specific plan. And uh, I'll uh, uh, finish my, uh, the balance of my time by just making the point that uh, in the 
DIR, one scheme was presented, and in the CUB and the CDP, another scheme was presented, and now in this uh, Area Planning Commission uh, public hearing, uh, yet another uh, scheme is being presented, and the question comes to my mind is, what is it that you're being asked to approve here? At some point, there has to be a scheme that is the final scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Liko Hamada, Roxanne Brown, Brad Looney. from 259 Hampton. I'm honored to follow the owner of the Firehouse Restaurant who runs things legally and is a good neighbor. And as she said, this restaurant has operated illegally. You see a picture right down there with everybody sitting, there's full service, and there are tables on the sidewalk, as she said. I'm for restaurants that operate legally and are good neighbors. Okay, um, and speaking of that, here we go. I have a copy of the CUP application, which the owner filled out. Item I, perhaps you have this in your files. If not, I'll hand it to you. And the question is asked, is the site within 1,000 feet of any schools, public, private, or nursery schools, churches, or parks? The, whoever filled this out answered no. Capital N, capital O. In fact, in the 200 block of Hampton, there are two churches, one synagogue with child care. There's St. Joseph's Center, which does religious services every day and child care. And I'm going to go to the map, and I'll shout and point it out. You, can't, you have to be on the microphone. I have to be on the microphone. Okay, you guys. Okay. Where it is. Okay, great. 
Okay, so go ahead and point out the church, which is directly across from the restaurant. I think it's 35 feet. Ben, did you find it? Okay, then go down on the side of 259 Hampton, and I, the feet is on there. It might be 300 feet. You find the synagogue with the daycare directly across from that synagogue. Again, that's like 400 feet. Is St. Joseph's Center that offers religious services and child care. And then next to St. Joseph's Center and a little dropped back, you can reach it from Hampton, is St. Clement. The blue stripes are residents, and you can see the whole block of condos on Main and Rose, the Renaissance she just spoke, and you can see the residents lined up on the opposite side of Hampton from the restaurant and all around. Um, and as you know, we've got many, many restaurants with alcohol on Rose, on Main, and this restaurant is two blocks from the boardwalk, and Rose Avenue is a coastal access route that's already a congested area. And um, I say, please don't support what we're starting to call in Venice property gangsters, people who buy a property and do whatever they want to regardless of the law. We're seeing a lot of that. And we support businesses that follow the law and are good neighbors. And you're really not a good neighbor when you're proposing an outdoor patio, alcohol and patrons, um, 14 feet and 10 inches from one residence. And is my time up? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brad Looney. I live at 236 Hampton. And I'm the building manager there. I represent that building as well as all of its tenants. In addition to 242 and the one. So basically, um, I'm across and a little bit north, and we're the last three residences. So I'm representing 12 units. Um, I mean, first off, these guys can put in 50 parking spots and close the entire roof and they'd still be bad neighbors. Those bicycle spots are non-existent because they've already got the tables on the sidewalk blocking it. That's the only place they could even have any bicycle spots. Um, what, you know, I've lived there about nine years, so I was there when there was a small catering establishment in a, in a, a weightlifting powder, you know, boost regime workout shop. And I've watched it change, and it's affected the street, it's affected parking. Um, one of the biggest things that's concerned me, like as a surfer, is, is the waste that I've seen. You know, when you, when you get a permit to be a restaurant, there are things that come with that. You have to have a place to put used oil, used dishwasher, and that stuff doesn't get to go down the sink. But that's what they do. They don't have a dumpster for oil or anything. Every night, you see this outpouring of liquid out that back door next to the little residences there that just runs down to the gutter and flows into the ocean every single night. And I don't think that is a good neighbor. I don't think that's a good citizen. I don't think that's good for humanity or any of those animals in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sarah Shook, Gim, Zobrist, Bisbet, I'm sorry. I, I apologize for butchering anybody's name. I'm getting a little punchy here. Hello, my name is Sarah Shoup. I'm a resident of Venice. Thank you for taking your time to listen to us. We as a community and as residents ourselves and owners of properties ourselves as well, we have a very high concern for a restaurant bar that would come into a community this stature. Um, without, it, without being properly permitted in the first place and operating for years illegally and now coming in and asking for more variances and an okay to operate an establishment that's going to have daily disturbances to the neighbors and the residents that have to endure this day in and day out, the families that live there, the children that have to go walk past it to go to school in front of the, al the alcohol, I mean, it's we live here, we're residents, as the commissioner stated. It's not Disneyland. As much as it is a tourist attraction, we still live here, this is our neighborhood. And it's questionable because, you know, even if there's conditions placed on this, 
Building and Safety knew it was operating illegally, and it still wasn't enforced. So what makes you think that they're going to enforce conditions? Because they're the ones who have to enforce it. Secondly, is even with the noise mitigation, even if they put up the wall, that's just for ambient noise, for people talking. This bar is going to last into the wee hours of the night. Even if it's not a bar, if there's a counter and people can still drink, they're going to drink at it. If there's tables and they can still drink, they're going to drink at it till the bar, till the restaurant closes, whatever you want to call it. And then if you add music into it just for ambience, so that they have a good environment to hang out in, how much more noise does that create? And then the people have to talk above it at intoxicated levels. And all of this has to be endured by the neighbors. The Rose Cafe that was mentioned that's going to get the alcohol permit, it's not granted an alcohol permit. It, it is up for a hearing right now. And they've done everything legal. And they only operate a breakfast and lunch service. They don't operate dinner hours. They're not that big of a disturbance to the neighbors. They are a good neighbor. And what is the difference between a counter and a bar? Because a counter, once you put stools at it, wee hours of the night, and you're serving a full line of alcohol, because it is a CUV, then you're drinking, right? It's a bar. It's not a counter anymore. And the valet, where does that go? There's no space on that street for the valet to pick up cars. Where do they, it's a one-way street, how do they get around, or it's a two-way street, but how do they get around in two ways? Once they, once the valet picks up that car, how do they, how do the rest of the people that are just trying to pass through to get home, how do they drive past that? It's congested and dangerous. It's a safety hazard. And on top of it, if they're going to use bicycles to complete their parking requirements, where do these bicycle racks go? Again, like someone had already mentioned, there's already tables on the sidewalks. That's a public access way. You can't walk through it with tables there. How are you going to walk through it with tables and bicycles there? Because that's the only place for it. They don't have space. They're built out to their, to their property lines. Where does it go? And if it's going to go in the street, that's public parking. We're already condemned by public parking. Public parking is where a beach area. And I can't imagine the Coastal Commission would allow to use a public street in a dual jurisdiction area for bicycle parking and take it away from the public and beach access. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Dean Zobris, and I own a property right across from 255 Hampton Drive. But we live in San Francisco Bay Area. We're just happy to be here that to express our concern about 259 as permit to be a food restaurant and an alcohol bar. Because uh, right now we don't live there, but our children live there. And every time we come visit, we have to just like drive you know, around, around, like two, three blocks, fire parking. Uh, if we're lucky enough to find a parking near where we live, we just don't want to leave because if we leave, somebody will take our place. So that's a really a problem, and, and we just want you to, you know, concern about that with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Lisbeth Goranza. I live on uh, Vernon Avenue in the 300 block. And it's a peaceful, quiet street, and I do not want it to change. It, it's already very difficult to park there. Um, what other people have said, Max have said such, so many very, very good things, and I fully agree with everybody. Frankly, I do not understand how this project could have been approved. It is just amazing to me. Um, something, the system seems to be broken. I mean, what are parking places? What are, you pay for parking, but there's no actual spot to park in? It doesn't make sense to me. It's legally to me. And, well, anyway, it's to be changed. So I fully, fully, strongly support this appeal. I think it would really not help our neighborhood in any form. It would make it a worse place. Thank you. 
Thank you. Edward Zobrist, Noel Gold, uh, Robin Woodsmith. Dispensing a full line of alcohol right directly across the street from us where we live. And for parking, yeah, they have parking. They park in front of my house. You've heard that? I have buddy along that street. That's where they park. It's the only place they can park. Now, Quite frankly, we have enough late night visitors staggering over from Main Street. We don't need more of those. Main Street takes care of everything down there. In fact, I would support them if they were located on Main Street because that's where they should be. Okay? Now, so I think we have enough hard liquor already, maybe too much. But now, right directly across where, where my kids live now. And it's talking about that police ladder. That doesn't surprise me. I see him parked there, coming in there all the time, regular route checking that specific area. So that's it. Thank you. And last of all, most important, I thank you five people for the service to the community. You have, I wouldn't want any, any of your jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you. That's why we get paid for big bucks. <laughs> big, really big bucks. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Noel Gould at 3003 Ocean Front Walk, Venice. And I'm a professional recording engineer for 33 years. I trained at Johns Hopkins University Peabody Conservatory. I was the chief audio consultant who managed West Delhi Music for 18 years, and I deal with tons of high-end clients. My expertise is in uh, sound and noise, in this case. Everything that's been said about noise is right on by our side. But there's something that hasn't been mentioned. There's something, a physical thing that occurs at night called temperature inversion. And it also occurs during dense cloud cover. And that's where the temperature increases as, as the altitude increases. And that is why you can hear sea lions a half a mile away at night. That's why you can hear the waves from a half a mile back at night. And that's why you can hear noise from a bar amplify two, three, four blocks away sometimes at night. So unless you're taking this particular restaurant and planning on completely enclosing the upper area, and building it with acoustically solid walls that are designed in an appropriate manner so as not to allow sound transmission, you're going to hear noise all the way up and down that street, unless it's completely enclosed. And there was a comment made in the, in the design that they were going to not have any windows on the property side, but the opposite side, there could be open windows. Well, the sound is going to come out of the open windows, and it's going to bounce around. 
You're going to have this eight foot high wall, this transparent wall that they're talking about. The sound is still going to come out. It's going to bounce off the wall. It's going to come out that side and it's going to get out in the neighborhood. Sound bounces. That's why when you hear an echo, 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 echo. Okay, that's what happens. The sound comes out, it bounces around, it bounces off the buildings. At night, it's amplified because of temperature inversion. Okay, this is a big problem. I don't think they're planning on completely enclosing this thing. And even if they did, you got a bunch of patrons in there, they've been drinking all night, their voices are elevated, they've been talking over music, and they walk out the door and they go back to their cars wherever they are. So as they come out the door, hey, that was a great time, yeah, yeah, hey, I'll catch you next week. Okay, hello, that's gonna carry and everybody's gonna hear that. Even if the building was completely enclosed acoustically, the patrons coming and going at that kind of a level is gonna be a huge disservice, thank you. Thank you. Robin Rudisell, I'm the uh, Venice Land Use and Planning Committee Chair for purposes of identification, but tonight my comments are just representing my personal views as uh, the Venice Neighborhood Council did not make any recommendation on this project. Uh, I'd like to reiterate what the appellant said in, in her um, appeal, which is enough is enough. The quality of life for these Venetians has been severely impacted by the types of projects that city planning has been putting forward. Uh, someone said a minute ago they just can't understand how this was even approved, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, the term by right that is thrown around for something like this is uh, misleading, and that's where the flat out lies begin. There are innumerable unacceptable aspects of the project, and I hope at some point someone challenges the overall process and, and asks why city planning is putting such a project forward. Um, well, I, I've crossed out a lot of points because they've already been mentioned, but I have a few more. The project uh, did not get a recommendation from VNC, and that's because when they brought it to the Land Use and Planning Committee, and, um, they could not get comfortable that the impacts of the sound would be mitigated, uh, meaning the noise. Someone mentioned a minute ago they thought maybe we were uncomfortable with the parking. I actually was the applicant's rep. And uh, that was secondary. It was actually the noise was our biggest concern, and we could not see any type of um, effective mitigation. Um, the uh, we don't understand why the city would, in essence, reward the behavior of the applicant and the owner um, with no violations, no penalties, and a legalization of their activities straight to a full alcohol CUB. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, the, um, probably the most alarming thing is that this has been approved, assuming the noise impacts will be mitigated, but as many experts have said here tonight, it's impossible, and I know there's a provision in the, uh, I think it's, my, it's either specific plan or LEMC that says, if in the end it's not possible to mitigate it, um, it's just not feasible, and, and, and that's the way it is, and so we can't just, uh, we have to know now before this thing is approved and, and constructed. Um, uh, a minute ago, we were talking about a parking question that we did research and have an answer for you on. Uh, the, uh, I want to clarify about the in-loop parking. On Venice Pacific Plan, uh, page 24, section 13C, it says, a change of use that results in a change in intensity of use should be required to comply with parking standards, etc. Uh, regarding in lieu fee payment. Well, the definition of a change of use uh, in the Venice Pacific Plan uh, does not include a change from commercial to commercial use. It only includes residential to commercial industrial, existing commercial to residential or industrial, and existing industrial to residential or commercial. And that is why uh, we have been informed by um, legal experts that the in lieu fee parking uh, uh, is not an option. Um, and I believe that this uh, definition Excuse of change... Excuse me, Fisher, uh, that, run that by me again. They're not seeking a zone change here, right? No, but it's the definition of change of use that's used in the parking section to say what, whether an in-loop fee payment is uh, an option. And that change of use doesn't include a change of use for commercial use to another commercial use. Okay. 
Also, could you explain to me again, I didn't quite understand why the Venice Neighborhood Council did not take a position on this? The uh, project came to us, uh, this, this is what I know, and I've looked in some minutes and tried to find that answer. It came to us uh, just after it went to the public hearing in October uh, 2013, I guess. And uh, when it was presented to the LUPEC, we could not understand how the project would work. Uh, because it, we couldn't see that something open air and, um, and serving alcohol and uh, the, the hours they were talking about could have a mitigation in terms of the impact on the neighbors. And they, they didn't describe anything to us that sounded like it would work and uh, there was no vote taken because it, we felt, felt that there was nothing worth proposing, okay. if that makes sense. And it didn't come back to us. Okay. They never came back and proposed anything that would work. Um, and in terms of uh, the FAR, I also uh, got a little bit more information on that. It, it's true strictly that in, um, it applies to commercial zones, but you have to remember, even though this is an industrial zone, um, it, it's uh, a restaurant use is not a preferred use uh, in an industrial zone, and. And therefore, because of the fact that it is a restaurant and in the commercial zones for restaurants, they have that limitation of 0.5 to 1. I think there's a good argument to say that that should apply for this establishment. Okay. Just a couple more things. Uh, the fact that the LAPD was not even consulted uh, before this project was approved is very disturbing um, to me personally and I, and I think that's a big mistake and, and I appreciate the fact that they've come through now at the neighbor's request and recommended that this uh, be, the project be denied. Uh, I think that's significant and when you look at the um, finding for undo, uh, the premises, over concentration of premises, I don't see how they can make that finding knowing that and knowing of the high crime and also knowing that the state limits are to um, uh, on-sale uh, um, premises and there's currently 12 in the area. I just don't see how that finding is found. Uh, and then um, there's also one other very important finding for the CDP and that is finding two uh, where they've actually included a qualification uh, that says on an individual basis the project is not anticipated to prejudice the ability of the city to prepare an LCP. And I've consulted with the Coastal Commission on that and they said it's not appropriate to condition this finding. It has to also be met on the basis of cu cumulative uh, impact, not just on an individual basis. And I've never seen this uh, qualification before, so I, I don't think this finding can be made either. Um, and finally, um, just on the parking, I, I question not having any handicap uh, parking at all, along with just not having any parking. And um, uh, so I, I don't see how that works. But uh, and on grandfathered spaces, I think the same definition of change of use applies um, because it's uh, not considered a change of use as defined in the Venice Pacific Plan. I don't think that they can grandfather the spaces. Okay. I, that can be checked. All right. So I, I urge you to deny this project. I, enough is enough, as I said earlier, and it would just be an unacceptable impact on this neighborhood. And I also want to say I'm so proud of these people tonight. They've done a tremendous job, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Amanda Borgia, Stephen Fowler, Eric Orloff. 